So this is advanced patterns for automated UI testing. I have subtitled this trade-offs all the way down, which you'll see in a little bit. Uh, because there's not very many of us here, uh, feel free to you know, ask questions in the middle, raise your hands, feel free to interrupt me if you want. Uh, I want to start out with the uh, obligatory audience participation survey. How many of you are writing UI tests in your projects today? Okay, cool. Does anyone here uh, used to write them but then gave up for whatever reason? Okay, yes. <laughs> so one thing I think we can probably all agree with is that UI tests can suck, right? They take more setup work than other tests. They are uh, slow to execute. You can't do them in parallel. They're hard to debug. And if you do them wrong, they're brittle, right? Even a tiny CSS change can break your whole suite. And because those tests take so long to run, figuring out why it's broke and then fixing it can be trouble, uh, you know, frustrating, time consuming, painful. So if they're so problematic, why even bother? Why are you even here in this session when it's all nasty outside? And the answer is that UI tests give us something no other type of test do. They give us confidence that the code is going to work correctly in the browser where it really matters. So your unit tests tell us that your tiny pieces of, of code work correctly, they return the correct values uh, in isolation. Your integration tests tell you that those little tiny units will correctly modify the database when called from your test runner. But only the UI tests go that final mile. They tell you the browser can parse the HTML, build the DOM, run the JavaScript, and let the user accomplish what they actually came to do. Now that increased confidence comes at a cost, right? UI tests pose a number of challenges that other test types don't. If you don't approach uh, UI tests with a guiding strategy in mind, you may have a hard time keeping those tests green and managing that cost over time. That's why people might give up when things get complex. And that's the point of this talk. So I run a pretty small team and we've been actively developing a very complex and large web app for eight years. And our app is very configurable, it's dynamic, it's data driven. And as we've added more and more features, the effort to regression test has gone through the roof. So we currently estimate it would take a single person to regression test every nook and cranny of that app about seven to eight days. That's an enormous amount of cost to add to every release. So to avoid some of that cost, we've been exploring ways of automated testing. And about four years ago, we started messing around with automated UI tests. And we've learned some things about what works, what doesn't work, what's painful. And my goal today is to share those lessons with you so you can kind of learn from our mistakes and maybe make better choices and have less pain in your own journey. So today you're gonna to see how we decide whether to use UI tests or something different for any given feature how we use the page object pattern to organize the tests themselves, how we create and manage test data, and how we design our UIs and components to be UI testable in the first place. You are not gonna see a lot of slides about WebDriver or Selenium itself. I am not gonna teach you how to actually automate the browser. If you don't know that already, that's cool. You do not need to know that to get value for the next 55 minutes. I'm gonna focus on concepts, patterns, the overall strategy. Doesn't really matter how good you are at Selenium, if you don't approach this with the right strategy in mind, it's gonna hurt a lot. I do wanna manage expectations a little bit. If you are hoping to learn the one true secret of UI testing, you are going to be let down, okay? This whole talk is a case study in trade-offs. Every decision that we've made in the last four years has consequences, and every decision has informed the ones that follow it. You might see things and think, well, there's no way that would work for us, or we would never do that, and that's cool. I'm not here saying this is the only way to do UI testing. This is what works for us. And even if you can't use these same techniques, maybe the things that we've learned, the ideas, will help. I primarily want to talk through the decision-making process that we've leveraged to kind of figure out what works for us. So the first thing I want to talk about is when you should and should not write a UI level test. And the main point is that you should do that only if a lower cost test can't sufficiently prove the thing you want to prove. 
So to kind of go into that a little bit, my team differentiates between four types of tests. Each type involves a different trade-off of cost and complexity. Unit tests are very easy to write. They run very fast. They don't give us a lot of confidence in the overall system. UI tests give us a lot of confidence, right? But they're very costly to write. They're hard to keep green. And in the middle, you have lots of different uh, trade-offs. So our strategy is to cover as much as we can at the low level, and then bring in these more costly things only when we need to, and to close specific gaps. So the goal is that we want to have a strategy and use the costly tests only when they give us added benefit. So uh, let's go level by level, and I'll explain that a little bit in more detail. The lowest level tests that we write uh, are unit tests, right? You take a tiny piece of functionality, you do it in isolation, you mock out all the dependencies, all the database, whatever, um, and you test that one little thing in isolation. So that's great for calculations, computations. Uh, maybe you want to do interaction-based testing. Does component one call component two without actually executing component two? So whenever possible, we try to write our business logic in a way that can be unit tested. Because if we cannot do that in the UI, that's great. That's better. The problem is that unit tests only tell us that things work correctly in isolation. They don't tell us things are going to work as a system. So many times in my career, I've had a whole bunch of green unit tests, but if I had logged into the site, it would have been a flaming dumpster fire of fail for any number of reasons, right? Database isn't working, logins busted, lots of things. So one way to increase the level of confidence that we get from our test suite is to have it hit an actual database. Now some teams will say that any test involving a database is an integration test. I like to think of, of differentiating between a data test and an integration test. So in our nomenclature, a data test is basically a unit test of the data access layer, right? Still a tiny piece of functionality, in a, but you're hitting an actual database. Um, we still don't know if the application will layer those data units together, but at least we know the queries are gonna work, right? The syntax is valid, it'll hit the database, it'll do whatever it needs to do. So that gives us a little more confidence. We move this needle to the right, but they're more costly. Now you get to create real data in a real database. Uh, they're slower to run because of all the additional systems. So data tests are ideal for testing things in the database, right? Basically, it's a unit test, but you need a database to do it. That's what we call a data test. To get more confidence, we gotta start taking those units and putting them together in concert and testing them as a whole. That's an integration test. So in practical terms, a data test and an integration test are very similar. They're both calling a piece of code with a real database, no mocks. The difference is that a data test calls some low level leaf node in the system, right? It's calling a piece of code and does not call any deeper into the stack. An integration test is calling something higher in the stack. It's calling a controller action. It's calling some orchestrating service. And it's doing that with a specific intention of going all the way down that stack um, and executing more and more code as a whole. So by calling into the higher level uh, parts of our stack, integration tests more closely simulate what happens in production. So a green integration test will give us a lot more confidence about the system, right? That we're getting some meaningful feedback now. But these are still more costly to write. If you want to write a data test for some data query, all you have to do is set up your database. But if you want to write an integration test for a controller method, you have to create your database and create your logged in user and maybe create the session object or whatever. There's a lot more stuff you have to get wired up so that you can go all the way down that stack and back up. So we primarily will use integration tests when there are business rules that are spread across multiple components. So we have lots of code that deals with form posts, right? Form post comes in, lots of logic, data validation, all these various components do stuff. Now we have unit tests for all those different pieces as well in isolation, but we get a lot of value from knowing that that overarching business rule or business thing will happen for real. But we don't need the UI to validate that. We can call that method, we can go to the database and see what changed or what didn't change. There's no need to involve the browser in this. So if we can't unit test our logic, our data business rules, we'll do them with an integration test. We try to avoid testing business rules in the UI.
So UI tests finished our trend line. They were the most costly thing that we can write. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. That's why you're here. They give us the most confidence. So we focus our UI tests on things that cannot be tested any other way. If you think about it, there are lots of things that are difficult or impossible to test without standing up a web browser or a web server, hitting it with a web browser, parsing the HTML, building the DOM, and doing the JavaScript. So simple edit page, right? Someone hits the, uh, an endpoint in our server, server returns an edit page, it's got two fields on it with some values, a button, to, uh, so the user can change their values, hit submit, posts back and changes the data. Very simple scenario. But think of all the things that can go wrong here. So maybe the, the, the HTML template does not initialize the default value correctly. So now the form renders, but the current value is not displayed. Or maybe there's a, a jQuery plugin in use, but there's some JavaScript syntax error, and the JS engine's like, nope, I give up. The plugin never actually runs. Or maybe someone changes a CSS class on some HTML element. They don't change the corresponding JavaScript. So the plugin actually runs, but there's no elements that it, it's gonna modify. Nothing actually happens. Or maybe the form tag is a typo, right? We're submitting to the wrong place. Or that thing used to exist, but someone refactored the controller. They didn't refactor the view, now it's broken. Maybe the field names on the form aren't what the endpoint is expecting. Maybe we're passing you know, foo and bar, but it wants data.foo or data.bar. So the form data gets submitted, but the server ends up not doing anything with it. So those sorts of things are impossible to catch with a compiler or a code level test. You cannot test for them without standing up the browser. So that's what we focus the UI tests on. That's their job. We rarely, if ever, will write UI tests for back-end business rules. It's almost always a way to encapsulate those rules in a better, more easily testable way. We use the UI test to make sure that everything as a whole is going to stand up and let the, the user achieve some high-level objective. Now, you may have seen the testing pyramid before, right? This tells you you should have lots of unit tests, fewer integration tests, even fewer UI tests. I don't like thinking of this as a, as a, as a pyramid, because a pyramid suggests that there is a proper proportion of one type of test to another. And that thinking has not really been useful to us. So instead of thinking as a proper proportion, I think of it like intentionally designed jigsaw pieces, where each type of test is closing some specific gap left by other types of tests. The actual proportions could change from just app to app or feature to feature. It's not that important to me. I don't really care if on one given feature you have more, of uh, more UI tests than integration tests if everything that needs to be tested is being tested at the right level with the correct type of test. The main point is that you should have a strategy right, that's specific to your scenario and not following some arbitrary geometric shape. So once you've decided that you have a feature that's worthy of a UI test, you need to write the actual test. That means dealing with four different things. What data has to exist in the system already? What user will you be used to perform the test? How does the test get to the page in question? Does it need to add something to a cart? Or you know, what needs to be set up to kind of set the stage for the test? And then once the browser is on that target page, how do you write good, clean, maintainable test code? And there are trade-offs and challenges at each of these levels. So I'm gonna start with the test code itself and then work our way backwards. Like many teams doing UI testing, we organize our tests using the page object pattern. This pattern has us create an object, a page object, for every page that we're gonna to wanna to test. And the job of that object is to provide an API that tests can use to interact with that page. So this is an example of a, a login or a, pay, a page object for a login form. So the first thing that a page object will do is expose public properties, exposing or representing the HTML elements on that page. So a login form is gonna have a username and a password field and a submit button. So there's public properties for all those things. Now we use Selenium. And Selenium WebDriver gives us this nice little finds by attribute <clears throat> where we can declaratively map each element to the DOM. 
Now there are many different strategies that WebDriver gives you. There's lots of ways that you can actually do this, but the vast majority of our code will use one of three methods, either an ID lookup, a class name lookup, or a selector lookup. And these are just ways that WebDriver will handle the actual mapping and we can just deal with kind of the overarching I guess, uh, approach. And we'll talk more about uh, this here in a little bit. Page objects also provide methods that are the services that the page object provides to the test code. So the whole point of logging in of a login page is to log in. So a login page object might collect or might have a method that collects a, uh, the password and username. And this is what encapsulates the writing of those values to the UI and then submitting the form. So the idea here is that if more than one page or more than one test needs to do a login, they can just call this method and not deal with this implementation detail over and over again. That helps keep the test code clean and avoids duplication. And the key point is that a, a good page object provides an application-centric API for writing your tests, not an HTML-centric one. They should allow a test to do anything a human being could do without knowing anything about the HTML structure at work. So that means your tests are easier to read, they're easier to write, and it avoids duplication, right? You change uh, you know, the, the, the field name on your login form, all you need to do is change the page object and not pay, change every single t uh, test that cares about that specific field. Now this is called page object, but you does not have to be used at the page level. You can and should have page objects for any significant UI element in your system. So in our app, we have this thing called a comparison rule. And a comparison rule can be configured in lots of different places. Now the comparison rule is implemented as a modal pop-up, pops up, user does something, and it saves some JSON to a hidden form field. So we use that in multiple places. So we've wrapped a page object around that modal pop-up. So anything that wants to use that, right, will call, will have some page method that will trigger that pop-up, whatever is appropriate for that page, it'll return an instance of that page object for that modal, and then that uh, we can do something with that thing, do whatever we want to do, and then continue. And you can apply this pattern for a single page application as well, right? Maybe you're one of the cool kids doing the single page app, not this legacy stuff that we do. The single page app is only one page, but that page has multiple views or context that can be within, right? So every state it could be in could have a page object that exposes the things that are accessible in that state. So page object is a really good high-level pattern. But out of the box, it doesn't necessarily encourage you to write good UI code or UI test code. So we have some additional like micro patterns that we've defined and layer on top of page object that we think helps keep the code clean. So the first thing that we do is we create a base class that all the page objects derive from. This base class is what maintains the WebDriver instance. That's the thing that actually deals with automating the browser. Now a lot of sample code will have you pass this thing around in all of your tests. We don't like that. We think it's cleaner if that's kind of taken away. So our base class will manage that web, web driver. And by doing that, we can then replace lots of boilerplate code with cleaner code. So here's an example. This, the base class provides this static factory method called get instance. So when we call this, we pass in the type of thing, the type of page we want to create, object for. This is what manages the web driver. It tracks that. It populates it. This is what also calls init elements. This is kind of important. This is the thing in WebDriver that binds all those properties to the DOM. So if you don't call this, your page objects aren't doing much for you. Now a lot of sample code will have you call this method in your individual tests. We think that's ugly, and pushing it into a base class helps us write cleaner, cleaner code. This is what it looks like from the calling side. We'll generally construct our page object in our in a setup method. And then we, down here, we just call some method, right? We don't need to pass the web driver around all these different uh, method calls. Another thing that we do in all of our page objects is to provide a go to page method, which makes it very easy for tests to get to the page in question. When we first started doing this, 
we did everything the same way a user would. So our tests would log in, they would click the menu, they would click the sub-menu, they would go through exactly the same way that the user would use the site. This made the tests very tedious to write because you're doing lots of navigation over and over, it's pointless. And it made the test take longer because you're hitting all these intermediate steps that may not be necessary. And it made the test brittle. So at one point we had you know, 50 different tests for the admin area. They would all log in and click the administrator link. Well, our app is configurable. And one thing you can do is change the menu items. So during a test, some manual tester changes that link to say admin. And all of a sudden, all 50 tests start failing, right? So just like with unit tests, we want failures to be meaningful and actionable. A failing test should tell you what's wrong. And if you change some random navigation element and a whole bunch of tests fail for no apparent reason, that's not telling you a whole lot. It's not really actionable. So as a result of that debacle, we started including this go-to page method on all of our page objects so that tests can navigate directly to where they want to be. Now it's very important that at least one test navigates through the menu items, right? You want the confidence that those menu items actually work, but you only need one test to do that. Once you have that, all your other tests just go right to the page they care about and do their work. So our general implementation looks like this. There's a uh, base class that defines an abstract string, which is the, the URL for that page. And then every page object includes a method, the goTo page method, that basically just uses that value to navigate. Pretty simple. And you might be wondering, if this thing is defined up here, why is the goTo page method down here? Why not just define this whole thing on the base class and make it easier? And the answer is that some pages have required parameters. And we don't want there to be a parameterless method if that's not going to be a valid navigation. So defining that method in the individual page objects lets us customize that, that signature for that page. This page has a required ID. You have to have that value to go here. You can optionally pass in this keyword. So with C-sharp, we have optional arguments. So we can, use, we can uh, indicate that this is required. If you try calling this and don't give a UI, the compiler will tell you. And a compile failure is way faster than a failed UI test. And in the future, if we add some new parameters, some new special thing that has to be there, the compiler will tell us what tests are affected by that. So once we have a page object written, and it's easy to get to that page in question, it's time to write an actual test. And that brings up a whole new set of challenges because now we have to deal with test data. The main product that my team develops is in the licensing and credentialing space. And one of the things that we can do is model the process by which someone applies to become licensed to be like a doctor or a nurse or a hairdresser or whatever. Now you might imagine that there's a lot of complexity in that. You know, applicants need to fill out multiple forms. There's lots of types of data that need to be collected. There could be fees involved. There could be applications uh, like review and audit processes. There could be um, background checks. So all that stuff has to be configured in our application. And because the data entry forms that are used to collect that data are so critical, we decided that they needed to be UI tested. But as we started writing more and more UI tests, we realized that test data management is one of those things where there is no best practice. It just doesn't exist. That every choice that we made would be flawed in one way or another. That's a big part of why I say this is trade-offs all the way down. So because there is no best practice, I can't tell you what you should do. I can tell you the choices that you'll have to make the consequences of each one, and how we've chosen to manage them. So the first thing we need to choose when writing a test, so let's say that we want to write a test for one of my data entry forms. The first thing we have to choose is does that test render a form that's already been configured and already exists, or does the test create its own data on the fly? So let's say that we want to render a pre-existing form. That'll make our test really easy to write. There's no setup code, right? All the thing already exists somewhere. That's awesome. But how does the developer remember 
the ID or the key? How do, how do we know how to link that pre-built thing into our test? So we'll probably want some kind of list or an index of all the things that we've built previously that can be used. That way a programmer can just pick from that list and be very happy. In the beginning, that list is small, right? Maybe I want, uh, I have a form with an application feed. I have a form with a multi-tab UI and a form with a manual review step. Okay, that's pretty easy. I can pick between those. But things don't stay simple. Over time, that's gonna grow. Now we have a form that collects a fee on a single tab UI, a form on a multi tab UI. There's one with an audit and a fee, a single file upload, a multiple file upload over and over again. Now I made these things up for this talk, right? But the need to highly specify the data context for a test is a very real need in the complex system. It's very common that you need to specify many, many details in order to create the precise condition that you need for a given test. And the more and more pre-built special cases that you have, the harder it will be to manage and pick between them. Someone has to set all these things up at some point, and then what happens when we have a test that needs to collect a fee and do a file upload and have a single tab UI, right? None of those pre-built things have all that collection. So what do we do? Do we go and create a new one? We go and reload the database and we add that new thing. Then we take a snapshot, put it in Subversion or, or Git, push it back up to source control, modify this list, add it. That's a lot of work. And the whole point of using pre-built data is to make your tests easy to set up. And that's no longer easy. So that's painful, time consuming, and we don't really want to do that. What if we started with one that already exists and we modify it in some way? So maybe we take a piece of SQL and we say, well, there's already one that exists that is a, as a fee, let's just make it multi-tab and then we'll just use it in our test. That, that reduces the amount of uh, permutations in our setup, which is good. This is kind of a bad idea because now you're, you're making permanent changes to glo global shared data in each test. And that's not really good. This makes your tests hard to understand because you never really know uh, the, the context for a given test. You don't know what state the data will be in when it runs. And let's say you run your whole test suite and test 217 fails. You're like, okay, so you run 217 by itself and it passes. You do the whole suite again and 217 fails. So somewhere in that first 216 tests, something's not working right. But how do you figure that out, right? It's a very painful sp a spot to be in it's because something somewhere is monkeying with that shared state. So in general, if you can't tell, I'm not a fan of this approach. I don't really like it. I think it seems simple and easy at first, but there's lots of hidden cost and complexity. It's worth having in your toolbox, but it's probably not the best thing to go to first. So to help my team know like, when we should and should not use pre-built data, we have four rules. Rule one is that we can do this for UI tests only. Our unit integration data tests all are required to create data on the fly, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and we'll talk about why UI tests can be a little bit different here. Rule two is that UI tests can rely on pre-built data only if it's legitimately difficult to set up. So we have code reviews, we have just our general team culture is that if you do this, you might get questioned, asked why. If you can defend it, that's cool, but we really want you to create data in the body of each test. Rule three is that UI tests should rely on the least amount of loosely defined data as is necessary to avoid that complex or painful part. So going back to that, that example of my data entry forms. So in my system, creating the application process is very difficult. Creating a data entry form is difficult. Adding a field to a form is simple. So rather than have a whole bunch of these pre-built forms in our system, we have a couple of forms that exist, and then we will just use them to, they're designed to be augmented by each test. So the test needs to say, I want to render a certain type of dropdown and a certain type of whatever together. It can just grab a pre-built form, add a new section, add those two fields, and render it. That's a very, um, does not impact other tests by doing that. So the goal is to stage the least amount of data that you have to 
and put as much of that specialization in the body of the test. It makes them easier to maintain. Now, I just got done saying that load pre-built data and modify was a bad idea. And step three kind of says, well, maybe that's what you should do. So our final rule is that UI tests that do this cannot modify that global shared data in any way that would impact other tests. So it's fine if a test loads up a data form, adds a field, and renders it. That's not a destructive operation. It's not okay if a data test were to delete that form or delete the process or, do, or change some major property on that form. Those things are going to impact other tests. That's not cool. I want to be clear. Using pre-built data sucks. It's a bad idea. You are depending on global data or you're modifying global data. And it's just full of pitfalls and pain. If you do it, you should feel a little bit dirty. But trade-offs all the way down, right? There are times that we have deliberately said, well, these trade-offs are better than other trade-offs, and we're going to do this. And when we do that, following these rules has helped manage the cost and the pain of doing that. Let's go back to that pretend test that we want to write. And instead of using pre-built data, let's have the test create what it needs on the fly. So the primary benefit of that approach is that, one, each test is totally independent of the others. Number two, tests are easier to read and manage because all the test context that they care about is right there in the test for you. There's no global state that you're making assumptions about. The drawbacks here are also significant. One issue that every test that creates its own data is going to leave behind permanent remnants of that run in your database. And if you're creating a lot of data, that can be a real problem, right? We use the same database for our local development and kind of uh, manual testing as we do for our automated tests. We really don't want that database filling up with reams and reams of junk data. Now, our data and integration tests get around that by wrapping every test in a database transaction that we automatically roll back. So we run an integration test. It may add a whole bunch of data. At the end, it just rolls everything back. There's no permanent leftover it leaves behind. But you can't do that with a UI test. Your test runner, your browser, and your web server are all running different processes. It's a lot harder to coordinate an automatic rollback at the test level. So another issue is that creating the, the, the data in the body of the test can be very difficult. So if I made the sample code a little more realistic, then creating a data entry form would require creating a thing called a credential, a thing called a member. But it turns out that a credential requires a thing called an interval and a thing called a board. And members have addresses. And all those things have their own dependencies. By the time that I've satisfied all those constructors, I had to write a whole bunch of data that's completely irrelevant to the tests I'm trying to write. It does not matter to the outcome of the test. Those values are noise. They make the test harder to write, harder to read, harder to maintain. And they obscure the values that actually matter. If there's something in this mess that's actually critical to the test, it's hard to spot. And these things make these, our test code brittle. If this constructor changes down the road, every test is going to break, even if the thing that we added is not relevant to this test. And of course, all that code creates something in memory only. A UI test has to have that thing in the database. So we still need to push that data we created into the database somehow. That has other problems and challenges. There's database constraints. There's the foreign keys. You have to create things in a certain order. All those uh, IDs that are assigned to the database level have to get pulled back into the object graph in memory so we can, we can reference them. So to address those issues, we have a whole library of data creation helpers that we have built to make it easier to specify data. And they look like this. For every entity foo in our system, there's a thing called the foo helper with a create method. And the create method exposes everything that might be configurable or customizable about that thing as optional parameters. So when a test calls the create method, they only specify the values they care about. The helper will then create reasonable defaults for everything not specified. They'll go all the way down that object graph if needed. It'll go all the way down and make sure that it returns a fully built, logically consistent thing. For a unit test, that's all we need. 
for a data integration test or UI test, we'll then call an additional method to save that thing to the database. Now we don't use our traditional you know, ORM or data access layer here because there's lots of different test specific complexity that we fight with. Various, various things that we want to do where we know that in a test scenario we want various little things that come up. So this save method will deal with saving things in the right uh, sequence. It'll make sure that all the IDs in that huge object graph are all consistent. They all point in the right place. It'll make sure that all the, uh, the sample data matches the database constraints that exist. The nice thing is that we use the same exact technique to create data in every single test that we write. Our unit tests can do this, and the data tests can pack on this. It's the same technique no matter what type of test that you're writing. And if we add new things, right, to our data, to our data model, the, uh, the helpers just need to add defaults, and our tests don't need a lot of ongoing maintenance as a result. This is not the only way to create data. You know, there are helpers and libraries that exist that'll give you generic APIs for doing this. There's lots of ways to create sample data. And you might be able to use your own ORM or your own data access layer to save them. For us, writing a dedicated uh, framework or API for this has been very valuable because it's allowed us to manage the complexity of the system. Trying to use a third party like you know, generic library and control the default data can be very difficult. We have our own you know, API that works for us and we've been very, very happy with this. I could go on and on about this and I have a whole hour long talk on just this pattern. But for today, the point I want to make is just that if you have your UI tests create their own data, do not create the data by hand. Doing that is a mistake. I don't care if you create your own helper library, if you use a third party thing, whatever. Just as long as your tests are short and sweet, and they're only specifying the data that actually matter, you're going to be okay. There's one other problem that you might run into if you are creating data in each test, that's caching. If your website is maintaining a web-based cache, or web-based cache, and you're modifying the database behind the scenes, those things are going to get out of sync. So what we've done is we've created an endpoint in our system that we can call that will just empty the cache. Any test that has created data that it knows is cached can call this method on our base class, just makes an AJAX call to the server and, uh, and, re and resynchronizes that stuff. So to summarize, using pre-built data makes your tests easier to write as long as that data exists. But it can make tests harder to maintain over time and actually staging that data and keeping track of what data exists is a huge pain. And if your tests have to modify some data, then you run the risk of one test breaking another test. If you write each test to create its own data, that's usually the better approach. It's gonna make your tests easier to read and maintain, but it might make them a little bit harder to write because you have to deal with all that data creation. Especially if you have a very large or complex data graph, those, uh, those, those costs can really be significant. Also, every time you run your test suite, you're going to be creating more and more data in that database. So to manage this and create a helper library, or some sort of API for dealing with and uh, re reducing the cost of that data creation and invest in something for cleaning up that test data. So we have some command line utilities that we can run that'll drop the database with one command, restore it to the last known good state, reapply all the local migration scripts from the working copy and get it back to that, that you know, clean state. That allows us to very quickly and easily get rid of all that, that cruft and get back to a nice clean, uh, clean spot. There's other ways to do that as well. There's other ways that you can roll back. That's worked really well for us. Now those things aren't free. They take effort, but they're the key to making this work over time. We've been doing that data helper pattern for I don't know, seven years, and it is, it is, I can't overemphasize how much, how powerful it's been for our team to have that very rich, easy way to create complex data with a couple lines of code. Now, as much as I hate relying on pre-built data, I hate one more thing even more, and that's using the side effect of one test as a starting point for another.
So let's say that your app lets people create and edit widgets, right? Because widgets are awesome. So it might seem like a really good idea to write tests like this. Test number one goes to the new widget form and submits it. So we know that we can create a widget. Test number two uses that same thing we just created to test the edit form, right? The edit form works. And then we test the delete button, that same widget. And truthfully, if that was the only three tests that you wrote, that's not bad. It's a tiny self-contained package. It tests a logical arc in the system, does not rely on any pre-built data, and cleans up after itself. That's pretty good. The problems come in when you start adding more and more things, and your nice little package gets bloated. So presumably, widgets have some reason to exist, right? Not just the CRUD screens in your app. So you might say, well, we need to actually render the widget in the application. Why don't we just put a new test between edit and delete that renders to some other, pay, some other part of the site, way the front end or whatever, and renders that widget in the application. It's just leveraging what already exists. Why not do that? Well, then later you add a thing called the, the type to a widget. And this type completely changes or impacts how that thing works. So now your, type, your first test creates a type one widget. And then you come over here, this becomes a use type one. Then you want a test to use the type two widget. So you clone this thing, you write some SQL, it changes that flag to type two, and now you have a test that will do the type two widget. So this is still a decent coverage, right? All of the features are being covered, but it's not a nice, neat little package. And if you keep following this pattern, you're gonna end up with just a very brittle, hard to maintain ball of mud. These tests are hard to understand because the only way to understand the starting point for one test is to understand the cumulative impact of everything that came before it. That sucks. And if the first test fails, everything behind it's gonna fail as well. So this makes it really hard to know what is really broken and that sucks. This makes it hard to run tests individually. UI tests are slow. You are going to want to run them in smaller pieces. But if you have to run a whole group together, then you can't easily do that. So my, advo my advice that you should never chain feature level tests together. If you want an end-to-end -end test covering some overarching business scenario, that's really cool. That test should exist. It should exist as a single solitary test that does the end-to-end -end thing. And it should focus on the overarching goal. It should not do all the intermediate uh, certs along the way. So you generally are going to want a test for each feature to test those things in small bits. And if you really want to, do all of this as one large but single test. The last thing I want to share with you is some techniques that we use to make our system more easily testable through the UI. And the first technique is basically a way of avoiding UI tests altogether and allowing the code to be unit or integration tested instead. It's, again, it's much cheaper and easier to do that than a UI test. So a common scenario that we have is that some piece of information should be hidden or visible based on something else. So for example, if the user is licensed, then we should show their some date, and if they're not, we give them some text or whatever, right? This is a contrived example, but you get the picture. If this rule is important enough to test, as written right now, it's only testable through the UI. So, right, we would need to create a user, set some property up, log in as that user, go to that page, and use a, a page object to see if that thing is visible or not. We'll probably also want the negative case, right? If they're not licensed, we don't want that stuff. So now we gotta you know, clone that test, negate a few things, and do it again. Now we have two user accounts being created, two people logging in, two you know, fairly expensive things happening to test a pretty simple little thing. So alternatively, we can move that logic into a method on the view model and then test that thing directly with a unit test, right? Way easier to do, way faster. So in this case, you uh, just pull a code into a mental method and you have, you create your helper, or your, you call your helper, create your thing in memory, and then you do a string-based test. No database, no browser, runs really fast. If you do this, you can also then 
test those different permutations, the true and false case, with the parameterized test. You can write one test, maybe, that covers multiple conditions very, very fast. Now, you can't always do this. This works best, obviously, if you're rendering HTML on the server and then shipping it down to the client. If the HTML is being rendered in the browser in response to user interaction, you're going to need a JavaScript unit test or something different. So, and of course, this test won't tell you if the string was, rent, was sent in the HTML, but then was hidden with CSS, or if some JavaScript changed the DOM and, and hid that thing. So, you got to use your critical thinking skills a little bit. If your page is highly interactive, highly dynamic, lots of things going on, then yeah, maybe a UI test makes a lot of sense. But if you're just rendering some HTML and, and, and showing it to the user with no other interactivity, there's lots of ways to get that logic into a, a unit testable uh, space. Next, I want to talk about how your tests actually target the DOM. So when we first started writing UI tests, we had the sense that we shouldn't change the code to support the test. I don't know why we thought that, but we did. So when HTML was complex and the test needed to have a very specific type of, of thing it cared about, then we ended up with page objects like this. So we're looking for you know, the link in the first span of a TD belonging to a table row with a certain class. I hope you can see why this is a bad idea, why this is brittle. Right? Maybe we change this to a div at some point and pff, test just died. So as a result, we started using UI test specific markers in our code. They look like this. So we will generally attach this, this prefix of selenium dash means do not use this class for styling. Do not use this class or ID for JavaScript. It exists only there so tests have a, an easy way to find what they want. And developers are encouraged to do this, right? This is okay, this is cool, you can do this. Now, I'm not saying that we never use real classes in our tests. It depends on the test. If the goal of the test is to see if some class is, exists, then yeah, test for that thing directly. But if there's no like natural surrogate or that you can use, then yeah, create a dedicated marker and make the test a little less brittle as a result. And then finally, I want to talk about test harnesses. So because our app is so dynamic and configurable, it's not always easy to get to a page where we can execute the code we want to test. So we support lots of different types of input fields on our forms. And some of them are really complex, lots of interactivity, they really need a UI test. But the only way to see it in a browser is to create an application process, create a data entry form, add the field, log in as the user, start the application, start the form, and there it is. The vast majority of that really expensive work is just to make the code executable so we can see the output. So to make that easier, we will create test harnesses for all of our UI components. And to do that, we have to actually componentize the UI in the first place. This is a really important concept. Doesn't matter if you're testing or not, doing component-based design makes your application, makes your software better. The idea is that if you have non-trivial UI, package it in some way, like a component or a helper that makes it easier to reuse it. Even if you think that UI is really specific to a, a one page only, you're never going to reuse it. Wrapping it as a component makes it easier to think about, makes it easier to reason about the behavior, and it makes it really easy to test because you can go right to that page and test it. It doesn't really matter what stack you're using. There's a way to do this. ASP.NET MVC has HTML helpers. jQuery has plugins. Vue and Knockout and React all have a, a concept of a component for making things reusable. And then we create a page for every component that is the test harness. This is a screenshot of a, an actual one we did recently. So we uh, added a third party you know, address verification system to our app. And this is the test harness for it. It has two pieces. On the left, there's just a form for collecting configuration data. You click the update button, and that's gonna render this form on the right-hand side and apply the component. So 
This is really helpful, even just for manual testing, right? You want to see exploratory testing. You can go right here, no complex business logic getting in the way. This is really easy to, to automate too. The, test hard, the, the, the UI test can go right to this page, put the configuration in here, hit a button, and then we have the UI that we want to test. These also serve as technical documentation. If a programmer wants to know how does that component work, they know they can go here and see an example of that, that UI being consumed outside of the business logic. Now, just like with unit tests, testing a component in isolation doesn't give us that, that, that kind of final confidence that's going to work for real. So we will generally write at least one test that does that component in the UI in a real business scenario. And that kind of covers the happy path. We know all the components are going to work together. But once we have that one test, everything else, all the if X then Y type things you might want to do are all done at the helper level. It's much, much easier to do that. So to wrap up, I want to just summarize the main things to remember when you leave here. Right? So first, you should have a deliberate strategy in mind when you're doing your testing. And, and you should only use the UI tests to cover gaps that you can't test any other way. And this strategy should be a first class part of your process. You should be discussing this in your handoffs, in your design meetings. If you find yourself testing what feels like logic via the UI, look for some way to refactor that to make it easier to do. Test data sucks. If you create the data up front, tests are easy to write but hard to maintain. And if you create data within each test, then tests are harder to write, they're easier to maintain. So my advice is you create some sort of data creation library that you can depend on that will reduce that cost and you automate the task of cleaning up that data in one way or another. And third, design all of your uh, non-trivial UI elements as components and then create harnesses for them. Makes it easy to automate, it's good documentation, and just it's good design in general. And that's it. Here are those three things for your screenshotting pleasure if you're so inclined. Uh, and the best ways to get a hold of me and this deck with all of my notes is on my GitHub right there. Also, please remember to leave feedback through the, uh, the feedback thing on the, the app. If you don't know what to say, I recommend that you Google for synonyms of awesome and just use them to describe me. That would be really cool. Uh, so thank you for your time. I have a few minutes for questions, uh, or if you want to get the hell out and avoid the snow, I will not take offense. So thank you for your time.